Hi everyone! Welcome to the Decorative Arts Trust Virtual Americana Week, Day 2. We are so happy to be here today in Long Island City at the Neustadt Collection. We are here with the amazing Executive Director and Curator, Lindsay Parrott. She's going to be showing us through this one-of-a-kind collection of Tiffany Glass. She has been at the Neustadt for 16 or 17 years now, so there is not a better expert to give us a guide through this space, and we are just thrilled to be sharing this with you. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to her. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to welcome members of the Decorative Arts Trust to the Neustadt collection of Tiffany Glass, and specifically to this wonderful treasure that we are proud to be custodians of our Tiffany Glass archive. Matt and I, about a year ago, were talking about how to bring members of the Decorative Arts Trust to this space. And as you'll see, it's a rather tight space. And so we would not be able to welcome all of you in person. So the silver lining of COVID is that you do get to visit virtually. So I'm very, very pleased to be giving you this tour today. A little bit about our collection. Um, it was formed by this gentleman, our museum founder, Dr. Egon Neustadt. He was an Austrian immigrant, came to the United States in 1925 and purchased his first Tiffany lamp with his wife at a Greenwich Village secondhand shop for $12.50. It was marked 15, but he negotiated down to $12.50. Can you imagine such a fantastic purchase these days? If you follow auction prices, I'm sure you cannot. Dr. Neustadt went on to collect more than 200 lamps over his collecting career. He passed away in 1984, and he left behind not only a tremendous legacy of Tiffany's leaded glass, lamps, and a number of windows that we count among our collection, but also this totally spectacular, and as Carrie said, one-of-a-kind collection of Tiffany glass. Our collection includes more than 250,000 pieces of glass, ranging from full uncut sheets, an example of which I will be showing you today, as well as very small little pieces the size of a fingernail that were used for Tiffany's spectacular glass mosaics. I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on the history of this glass and Tiffany's interest in leaded glass, what, what drew him to the medium and the transformations that he was able to implement into the history of sand glass. Dr. Neustadt purchased this collection in 1967. Um, it was purchased in one fell swoop, in one lot. He purchased some 500 crates of glass that had been left over from the closing of the Tiffany Studios in 1937. Now, he was the fourth owner of this material, and it is pretty miraculous that this collection stayed together. One of the other things that is um, really important to note about his purchase of this collection was by this time he had amassed a number of Tiffany lamps, and he recognized very early in the days of this kind of Tiffany revival in the 1960s he recognized the historic value of this glass at a time when people weren't interested in materials and fabrication as so many decorative arts enthusiasts and historians and scholars are today. Not only was he recognizing the historical importance of this material, but I suspect he was also probably trying to protect his investment. You can imagine that people would love to get their hands on this glass and make some kind of forgeries and, and repairs to original objects. And so he was very keen to protect his investment in that way too, I imagine. So let me give you a little bit of a history on um, Tiffany's, Tiffany's interest in stained glass and the ways in which it grew and developed. Um, Louis Comfort Tiffany, as you probably know, is the son of the co-founder of Tiffany & Company, Charles Louis Tiffany. And of course, Tiffany & Company is famed for its wonderful jewelry and silver. Now, that meant that Louis Comfort Tiffany was a very privileged young man and had the opportunity to uh, go on a grand tour. And while he was on a grand tour in Europe, he was visiting a number of cathedrals rich with medieval stained glass. 
And I wanted to just show you a couple of illustrations of the types of glass that he would have been seeing. These are some wonderful windows, including a rose window from Chartres Cathedral. And so the thing that Tiffany was so struck by as he visited these cathedrals and admired this medieval glass was the richness of color in the glass. The color was not painted onto the surface. It was actually inside the matrix of the glass. So it had a particular richness and vibrancy that he admired. You can see these luscious reds, these cool, wonderful blues and greens, and these fantastic accents of brilliant golden yellow. And in fact, Matt, if you pan over here, here's a wonderful detail that gives you a sense of the richness of these colors. Very jewel-like in their tones. Now, the thing that Tiffany also was very struck by was just how little paint was used to suggest the details in this window. You can see that it's uh, the details, for instance, the drapery here have been painted in. The hair, for instance, this looks like it may be um, rivulets of water, streams of water. So those are achieved through the application, I think you can see, of a dense black paint that is fired onto the glass. Tiffany appreciated how these details were rendered at such a minimum of paint because during his lifetime, stained glass looked more like this. This is a window where a single color pane of glass has been leaded into a grid and the stained glass artist has approached the surface of the glass, applying paint to it as a painter applies paint to a canvas. So they're not really making use of the glass, they're just making use of the glass surface. That continued to be true into the 19th century. And while the colors were a little more rich, the pieces of glass were a little smaller, there was still a huge amount of paint being applied to the surface. Again, I want to point out the ways in which the drapery has been painted onto this green glass, and that will come into play during our discussion today. Tiffany felt that paint applied to the surface of the glass impeded the passage of light. He didn't like how sort of dark and lifeless these leaded glass windows were. And so he, along with John Lafarge, one of his fellow um, stained glass artists, painters, and decorators, decided to branch out and try to find a new material that would harness the light harness color in a new way that would invigorate the construction of leaded glass windows. And so they turned to a type of glass that was already being used commonly for um, tablewares, particularly in America. And so Carrie's going to be uh, assist with the lights here. But I wanted to show you this covered sugar bowl, which was not owned by Tiffany. This is something that I acquired for the collection to uh, illustrate the point that I'm making here. This is probably Pittsburgh, probably from the 1840s, but look at the wonderful way that the light invigorates and enlivens this glass. Can you see that it changes from this kind of milky opalescent and as light begins to transmit through it, you get this brilliant sort of cool blues and sherbety orange amber colors. This was a perfect medium for Tiffany and Lafarge, both of whom were considered colorists, to begin to experiment with by applying different colors of glass, different patterns and textures to this sheet glass as they set out to transform the history of stained glass in America, really introducing a new chapter into the history of stained glass. Now, one of the articles that discusses in the 1880s um, Tiffany's innovations in glass describes how he as an American and John Lafarge and some of their other colleagues working in St. Glass were untrammeled by tradition. So as Americans, there was no native St. Glass um, tradition in America. And that was in stark contrast to centuries of tradition of stained glass making in Europe, for instance. And so with no history hanging over their heads, no history weighing down on their shoulders, they were able to experiment in bold, new, exciting ways, including taking opalescent glass formulas like this, rolling it into flat sheets, 
and using it in leaded glass windows. So Matt, if you would, I would love it if you would kind of pan through the aisles of glass here to give people a sense of the color range uh, of glass that Tiffany's furnaces were responsible for. One of the other things that Tiffany was pioneering in was expanding the availability of the color of glass. So while we do have red glass, orange, yellow, blue, green, black, white, brown, you can see that we have a tremendous variety of tones of glass too. So it's not just a cobalt blue, uh, a ruby red. We have lots of stunning arrays of color. So for instance, if you're looking here, take note of all of the different greens, for instance. So we have sort of seafoam greens and more dusky olive greens. We have streaky greens, uh, celery greens. The list goes on and on. And a note about the way that the glass is stored. It is stored in these wooden cubbies exactly as it was stored in Tiffany's day. Um, period photos document the same kind of storage material. And this is the way that the glass is safest on end in these sort of tight cubbies. Um, and certainly for space saving purposes, it makes a lot of sense as well. So if you would sort of slowly pan through again to give people a sense of the wonderful pinks and, and mauves and purples. So any color that Tiffany's designers and artists could imagine for their windows or lamps or mosaics, and any color that Tiffany's glass selectors had their hearts set on was available likely in glass racks just like this. So in many ways, a visit to the new set collections, Tiffany archive is like a step back in time to the Tiffany Studios. And to illustrate the point of how all of this glass was taken and transformed into a wonderful object, I want to share one of the lamps in our collection with you. This is a grape library lamp, and it was designed as a single unit. Frequently, Tiffany's lamps were mix and matchable, the shades and bases. But this is a particularly wonderful example to illustrate the variety of color, the variety of wonderful patterns and textures that were available in Tiffany's glass studio. So you see the, the fantastic different kinds of purple grapes that are being used here. Some are very opalescent, some are very transparent. This particular type of glass has a, a rough texture that is turned to the inside, the smooth side is facing the viewer. And I think you can see how the light perhaps sparkles off of that rough texture. Um, look at the different types of greens that are used for the leaves and for the backgrounds. It's a wonderful display of the artistry of selecting, but also the magnificence and excitement that Tiffany's glass chemists were able to achieve with these glass batches. So now I want to focus on some of the different types of glass that Tiffany was specifically creating and using for his work over the course of some 40 or 50 years that he was working in leaded glass. And when I say Tiffany, I should add a little asterisk. Tiffany is, of course, the grand overseer, the founder of the Tiffany Studios and many other firms that uh, he founded over the years. But he was employing a core of artists and artisans to um, produce these wonderful uh, works of art, and in some cases, many cases, design them as well. So we'll begin here with a look at Tiffany's um, pressed glass jewels. And we have some 110,000 examples in the collection. So this is just a small range of, uh, of some of the holdings, some of the glass in our holdings. But I wanted to point out a, a few different things to you. Um, you see on the table here, a number of architectural tiles, like these wonderful red ones. This has uh, a sword guard decoration on it. Tiffany was an avid collector of wonderful Japanese sword guards. So these sorts of architectural tiles 
were used in a variety of instances, but particularly as um, fireplace surrounds, kind of cladding the fire. If you visit the Mark Twain house, for instance, in Connecticut, you'll see some of these wonderful tiles surrounding a couple of his fireplaces. Um, I wanted to point out too, and make the point that Tiffany's jewels were pressed glass. And in fact, Carrie, maybe this is another time when, when your lighting assistance would be really valuable. So I'm showing you here two glass jewels that have been pressed in a mold. Molten glass has been ladled into uh, the mold. A plunger has been depressed. And you can see this sort of outline that is um, where the glass is much, much thinner. And that would allow Tiffany's artisans to crack these little pieces off to reveal just the rectangular or circular jewel. And so to illustrate that, let me show you, let me show you this one. Can you imagine that this would be removed, this sort of excess, and you would be left with something like this? Now, these jewels were used to embellish architectural settings. They were used to embellish windows lamps, a variety of metalwork, and they were incredibly useful. Some of these smaller jewels, like these, Matt, um, these might be used as dragonfly eyes. We have um, wonderful prisms that would be suspended from the, the lower edge of Tiffany's lampshades. So the list sort of goes on and on for the different creative uses of this glass. Here's a wonderful early tile, and I wonder if you can get this on camera, Matt. Can you see that it says, patented February 8th, 1881? This is a very early tile. I know it's a little tricky to see because the glass is so transparent. Are you able to pick that up? Great. One of the other things that um, is interesting about the collection is that we have a number of these pressed panels that were for one of Tiffany's later innovations in lighting. These are panels for a line that he called Fabril Fabrique. This is a line of shades that made use of these pressed glass tiles that looked like pleated or ruffled silk. And the advertisements for these were wonderful. They said something like, Unlike silk shades, these will neither soil, nor, nor tear, nor fade. And so they would be, uh, these tiles would be set into a metal frame and they would be sort of assembled, if you will, using either a piece of glass that looked ruffled, as I said, or pleated. And you would have one of these little guys on the top or maybe this is a better example. One of these guys on the bottom and one of these guys on the top. Imagine that this is the same lovely shade of, of lighter green. And they came, these were made in all different shapes and sizes, a number of which are represented here on the table. So these are one of the kind of later lamp innovations coming out of the Tiffany Studios, but very interesting in that they are an attempt to um, embrace more modern design that is becoming popular in the teens. So I don't know if you have an, a, a chance to sort of pour over some of the different colors on this end of the table and then we'll take a look at the glass, some of the sheet glass that Tiffany was creating. All right, so let's talk about the flat glass. There's so many different innovations that were introduced during the 1880s and 1890s. And the public was absolutely transfixed by the beauty of this glass, by the beauty of the windows. In fact, there are some very early articles from the 1880s that are rhapsodizing about the wondrous colors, the wondrous textures and patterns of this glass. And they even go so far as to include little black and white drawings 
of glass, which I will tell you, leave you pretty cold when you see this uh, wonderful material live and in color as we are today. But I'm so sort of tickled by the way that people were so excited about a material that they were motivated to include little line drawings of the glass. So let's talk about some of these different types. I have this arranged for you to give you not only um, kind of a, a quick overview for some of the, the stunning sort of majesty of color and, and pattern here, but also the table is organized to give you a sense of some of the specific types of glass that, that I wanted to talk to you in detail about today. So the first type of glass that we'll discuss is something called drapery glass. And do you remember how I had pointed out the painted drapery details in the photographs that I'd showed you in the book a few minutes ago? Well, rather than painting that drapery detail onto the surface of the glass, Tiffany worked with his uh, glass makers to actually manipulate the glass, the sheets of glass, while molten so that they would sort of crumple into these wonderful soft folds. So there were several types of drapery glass that the Tiffany Studios were producing. This is sort of a classic piece of drapery glass. So the way that this was manufactured, you would ladle molten glass onto a rolling table. You would pass the roller over it. Think about um, making cookie dough and using, using a roller, very similar. Lots of cooking and, and sort of um, cooking metaphors apply to glass making. And once you had the sheet of glass, you would press the edges of the still soft, rather molten glass until it buckled into these soft folds. You'd be using wooden paddles to um, sort of crumple the glass into these soft folds. So take a look at it through the light. Are you able to see that? Do you see how where the glass is thicker, very little light penetrates? But where the glass is thinner at the top here, it looks very wonderfully diaphanous. So can you imagine, for instance, this piece of glass perhaps suggesting the bottom portion of a flowing robe in an ecclesiastical window where the, the folds of the glass emulate the folds of clothes around, you know, as the, as the uh, gown kind of drapes around the human form and maybe even kind of rumples at the bottom edge. Now there's another type of drapery glass that they innovated called, whoops, excuse me, called ribbed glass. And this is such a spectacular piece. I have to tell you, this is one of my favorites. I love that you get a real sense of the way that the glass has moved and pooled as it has been rolled and manipulated. Can you kind of see the f wonderful flow of glass here? So this glass was made in the very much the same way. So molten glass was ladled onto the rolling table. A roller was passed over it to make it into a flat sheet. And then the roller was used to create these soft sort of pushes, these regular ribs. Can you see that they were pushing from this direction? Do you see the, the sort of movement of the glass this way? Now this would create um, a rather different type of drapery fold but one that would um, still be incredibly useful in interpreting the way that um, fabric draped around angels and saints, for instance, in many of these ecclesiastical windows, which were really the bread and butter of the Tiffany Studios. Now take a look at how beautiful this is when it's illuminated. And again, the thicker the glass, the more dense it is. Very little light passes through these thickest parts but the thinner the glass, the more it fires up. So you get this real sense of three-dimensionality. And can you imagine this piece of glass, for instance, being selected to be the bottom hem of um, one of these flowing gowns in a religious window with a little maybe painted foot peeking out this way and the train of the dress, the sort of bottom edge hem of the dress sort of flowing behind a person as they take a step forward. So there's a lot of movement in this glass and Tiffany's glass selectors and designers were trained artists in many cases and so they really did have a good sense of the way that drapery would fall around 
a figure. They had probably had as part of their training um, sketching from plaster casts from antiquity. Another type of drapery glass that was created is called fan drapery. And I think you probably have a good sense as to why that is. Made in a similar way, molten glass ladled onto a rolling table, the roller passed over it, and then the roller held stationary at one end, this end, and the other end sort of pushed in these gentle movements to create this wonderful fan shape. Now, we have a fantastic angel window in our collection that has a kind of a, a knotted bodice. The bodice is knotted right here. And of course, the fabric flows out in very much this similar way. And so this piece of glass, this type of fan drapery, would be specifically selected to um, give a sense of naturalism as the fabric was knotted and fanning out. Now, this is special glass. In addition to it being fan glass, it's something called dichroic glass. And so that means two colors. It's one color, this greenish color in reflected light where light is bouncing off the surface. And it's a fascinating, wonderful amber in transmitted light. So dichroic meaning two color. And again, you can see where the glass is very thick on these folds, very little light passes through. And so those ribs or folds or drapes remain green, whereas the rest of the glass turns to this wonderful sort of amber color. And as long as we're on the topic of dichroic glass, let me show you one more wonderful piece of dichroic drapery. This is similar in form. Can you see this to the yellow glass? This is rib drapery but it's dichroic rib drapery. Look at the magic that occurs when this is illuminated. Now, Tiffany's glass selectors would use what we consider to be the front of the glass, but they also would periodically use the back of the glass. And you can see that in some ways, the coloration is even more rich when looking at this back side. And so I hope you can envision just how painterly pieces of glass like this are and how they really would allow Tiffany's artists to achieve these paintings in glass that he was so keen to achieve. Now, in addition to drapery glass, they were also manufacturing rippled glass. And this is one such piece. It's, it's rather transparent, but note the very irregular ripples that you see here. Um, one of Tiffany's superintendents of his glass furnaces out in Corona, Queens, described the manufacturing process. And he said that the rolling table was actually on wheels on a track and it was moving. And then the roller that was rolling the sheet of glass sort of flat was moving at a different rate. So the result was to sort of jostle the glass in these very irregular ways and create sort of an artistic type of, of ripple. And this would be used in all manner of ways. I mean, of course, for flowing rivers and streams, particularly those that you see in um, Tiffany's landscape windows. Of course, it would be blue and not red. Um, it might be used for borders on windows, borders on lamps. Um, this was very useful glass. Now, another type of textured glass, sort of a textured drapery glass, was called feather glass. And this manufacturing process was very interesting. The molten glass would be dropped onto the rolling table. The roller would pass over it, flattening it. And then they would take the roller, and I'm going to just demonstrate the, the motion. They would take the roller and move it back and forth like this to push and pull the glass into this sort of herringbone pattern. It always sort of reminds me of um, 
making brownies and doing dollops of marshmallow fluff and then marbleizing it. Um, I hope everyone has had lunch or dinner. <laughs> but to give you a sense of just how wonderful this glass can be. And this came in all different colors and opacities. We, of course, have a lot of white feather glass. Um, but this innovation was particularly brilliant because every time you cut a piece of glass, in order to secure it into a window or a lamp, you have to wrap um, either copper foil or lead came around it. So that means you have a black outline around every single piece of glass. Now, if you're cutting each and every little feather and you have a black outline around each and every little feather, those wings suddenly become very visually heavy and you look like an angel dragging these heavy, heavy wings around behind you when you want to sort of capture or give a sense of uh, the ethereal. And so Tiffany's designers and glass selectors were able to cut very large pieces of this textured glass to suggest all of these little um, sort of uh, different feathers, individual feathers within these larger wings. And so this is another example, a little bit different, but you get a sense of this beautiful kind of pinkish white ethereal effect that one might imagine is uh, perfect for an angel's wings. These are also used though in some of Tiffany's windows depicting cockatoos and cockatiels. This was a very useful glass. Sort of along those same lines in terms of creating glass where you could use large portions of, portions of it that were suggestive of another thing, whether it be feathers or in this instance, tree foliage, is a type of glass that's commonly called confetti glass. I think you will probably understand why as you're looking at it. But we know that Tiffany likely was calling this foliage glass. And so huge swaths of this glass, very large pieces, even larger than the piece I'm holding now, would be used to suggest the foliage of a tree, kind of a dense thicket of brush. And the way that this glass was made was fascinating. I should add that John Lafarge was using something like this too. And if you visited the Metropolitan Museum, for instance, and looked at their Lafarge windows, you've noticed something rather similar. But to make this glass, you would take a gather of molten glass on the end of a blowpipe, and you would inflate that bubble of glass until the walls were so thin that it burst into all of these different little pieces of glass. And you would lay those down on the rolling table and then ladle another type of glass, another color of glass on top of it. So in this instance, you have orange, purple, and green little bits of glass fracked on the rolling table and then colorless glass is ladled on top of it. The roller is passed over that blob of glass and all of these little bits of fract get embedded into the surface in a very haphazard, unpredictable way. And it, the effect of it in windows is, is truly stunning. Um, take a look the next time you're at the Met, for instance, Take a look at the autumn landscape window and you'll see some wonderful use of this in the foliage and the trees. So Matt, maybe you can get uh, a close up here. You can see that some of this glass, this can be pretty unstable and, and in need of conservation periodically, but you can see that some of this glass has begun to delaminate a little bit. Um, in this instance, the, this little purple piece, you can see maybe this suggestion of the color of glass that used to be there. You can see that it's disappeared entirely. So this was in many ways a very experimental type of glass. Now all manner of color combinations was possible. Here we have something with sort of more orange, more autumnal colors on a dark base. Sometimes the glass is very dense with many, many, many pieces of fract layered upon one another. And sometimes it can be even a little more sort of granule rather than large fakes, just little bits and crumbs of glass. So there was a huge diversity of colors and sort of size of fract that was available with foliage glass. 
I want to show you now um, some wonderful sort of patterned glass like this, uh, this spotted piece of glass. I've never seen this used in an object. We only have a couple of pieces of it, so it's quite rare and wonderful. But this is, uh, spotted glass was made in a variety of different colors. The base glass would be one color, the spots would be another. And we have a wonderful full uncut piece of glass that is spotted that I want to show you. So Matt, if you will bear with me a moment while I grab it. As I said at the beginning of our tour, one of the wonderful things about the Neustadt's Tiffany Glass Archive is that we have some full uncut sheets. These are such treasures. They frequently don't survive, and we have about 40 to 50 examples of this. But take a look at how this wonderful uh, spotted glass lights up. And the transformation from reflected to transmitted light is just pretty dramatic and exciting. So imagine being one of Tiffany's glass selectors and confronted with a piece of full, a full piece of glass like this. And you need a piece that is maybe one inch square. Where do you begin? How do you make that aesthetic decision as to which piece of a sheet of glass you select for your window or lampshade? The people who are selecting these windows and lamps and mosaics, both men and women, had this innate color sense and were able to really visualize how each of these pieces would come together. These individual pieces would come together to create a harmonious, visually exciting whole. It was really a magical process to be confronted with all of these aesthetic decisions and to find each little piece of glass that would make the window or the lamp design sing and come to life. Um, Tiffany was also making a huge number of different kinds of streaky glass and this is one of the things that Tiffany's furnaces were most famous for was the ability to combine up to five or six colors in a single sheet. And so some of this glass is um, just a couple of colors. This was probably used for a sunrise or a sunset. You see a huge amount of this glass in Tiffany's landscape windows. And I should add here, and I should have perhaps added a little sooner, that because Tiffany began creating windows in about 1880, he didn't yet have his own glass furnaces in Corona, Queens until 1893. So for about 13 years, Tiffany was purchasing glass from other glass houses, and he was also working with other glass houses directing the production of glass, glass colors, glass types, and textures. And so it wasn't until 1893 that he really took the reins um, of glass making and brought all parts of the manufacture of windows into uh, in-house. Now this piece of glass, this gorgeous piece of glass is actually from another glass manufacturer, one of the glass manufacturers that he was working with very early on. This comes from the Kokomo Opalescent Glass Company in Kokomo, Indiana. They were founded in 1888. They are still in business today. Once the pandemic is over, I really encourage you, if you find yourself in Indiana, to uh, make an appointment for a tour of the facilities. It is so absolutely exciting to see this glass being rolled into flat sheets. The process is virtually unchanged, and it's, a, it's an eye-opening experience. Now, Kokomo Opalescent Glass was very famous. They were recognized internationally for their fantastic product. They actually won a gold medal in 1889 at the Paris World's Fair. But let me show you a piece of Tiffany's streaky glass. And I will tell you, it's difficult to say when asked which piece of glass is my favorite in the collection. But if I had to choose, it might be this piece. So I want you to take a look particularly at this passage of glass 
on this sheet. Are you able to capture all the different types of glass, all the different colors of glass that are swirled together? This is a wonderful piece and it really very much illustrates the artistry that Tiffany's chemists were able to achieve. Different colors of glass have different coefficients of expansion, making it difficult to combine them harmoniously. They don't always want to live happily together. And so to be able to balance those coefficients of expansion was no small feat. And I confess that as an art historian, that's as far as I go with that, with that description and explanation from the chemist who is on our board of trustees. Um, but this is just a tremendously beautiful, mysterious piece of glass. And now the back is very different. Are you ready? Completely different, gone are the spots. There are these wonderful evocative streaks and pools of color. So again, this is an instance where either the front or the back of a sheet of glass might be employed for a window or a lamp or a mosaic. And this may well have been a type of glass that was used in a mosaic that we're going to talk about for just a moment. Uh, Maxfield Parish designed Dream Garden, executed in Tiffany glass um, in Philadelphia. It was originally made for the Curtis Publishing House. So let me give you a visual here. A few years ago in 2016, 2017, the New Set Collection and the Corning Museum of Glass collaborated on the first exhibition exploring Tiffany's glass mosaic. And here on the cover of the publication that we did accompanying the show is a detail of the Dream Garden. And this was an exciting opportunity for us, not only because we have a wonderful Tiffany mosaic from the Columbian Exposition in our collection, but it was wonderful because it gave us an opportunity to really dig through our collection and look at the glass through a different lens. Historically, we have interpreted the glass archive through the lens of windows and lamps, which is the strength of our collection. But to begin to look through some of these little tiny pieces of which we have bins and bins and bins and bins, and be able to identify small pieces of glass that had been used to make specific mosaics was incredibly exciting. And I want to show you a few examples now that were used, that were created to make this tremendous mosaic. So maybe Matt, what I'm going to do first is show you these details in the mosaic and then I'll show you some of the pieces of glass. So take a look at these wonderful flowering rose bushes. And here is a detail on the next page of some of these fantastic little blossoms. And we actually identified a number of these that were left over in our collection. Now this mosaic dates from the teens and uh, I suspect it's one of the reasons that we have so many examples of glass that was made specifically for this commission. So take a look if you would at some of these Florets. These are uh, created using a technique, a Venetian technique known as Murini. And so while Tiffany's glass makers were innovating with new colors and, and textures and patterns and opacities and materials, they were still well aware of the history of glass making that came before them and employing some more traditional techniques like this um, Murini technique. So can you make out this, this rose blossom? And take a look at the back. This is one of the exciting things about our collection, is that you get to see what the back side looks like because it's not set into an object. You can see that some paint has been applied to accentuate the individual white petals, and you even see little remnants of gold leaf. I hope you can see them on camera. So the gold leaf was applied to really give these roses a kind of an extra punch and luminosity. So here's another example where they had cut, um, they'd only used half of it, but you can see on the back they have applied another kind of metal leaf or metal foil. This time it's aluminum leaf to give a wonderful silvery 
glow. And so in going through our collection, here's just one more of these blossoms. In going through our collection, we really, it felt like an archeological dig as we were identifying um, different types of glass that were used for this mosaic. And this is the, the last piece that I'll show you from, from this wonderful commission. But here are little slices of Murini that have been embedded into uh, a sheet of glass and they would be cut out little circles and used to create the more blossoms in this mosaic. So this is a wonderful document showing the sort of uh, the life and process of creating what is one of Tiffany's most impressive works uh, produced throughout the duration of his career. And so let me show you where these sweet little guys are located. So within this mosaic, that one piece of glass I was just showing you constitutes these tiny little blossoms. A little bit bigger in real life, of course. But you can see that a tremendous amount of work went into producing just a handful of pieces of glass in this extraordinary commission. There are notes from the Tiffany Studios or Tiffany Furnaces that talk about more than 240 different types of glass were created for this mosaic ex, uh, commission. And it took more than two years to produce all of the glass required for this fantastic mosaic, which measures about 15 feet high and uh, 49 feet long. So it's a monstrous, really more of a mural. Now, I think that what we will do next is, actually, let's take a look at the window we have a wonderful window on, um, that is sitting out on a bench, an angel window that illustrates some of these different types of glass that we've just talked about. So you can see them being used. So here we have this lovely angel dating from about maybe 1905, 1910. We're not sure where Dr. Neustadt purchased this angel we, in fact, have two of these in the collection. And she's in need of some serious restoration. We, we can't stand her up. I think you can see that she has some condition issues. Um, some of the leads are failing. She has actually grown a little bit. We're not sure why this panel has um, sort of expanded. But you get a sense of how brilliantly, for instance, feather glass might be used note her wings and all the different sort of textures and, and uh, features of the feather glass that we were looking at, the ways in which they've been used for the tops of the wings, these long pieces of feathers. And I also wanted to show you um, the way that drapery glass might be used in flowing robes. So take a look at this tight little sort of drapery ripple detail of her dress these thick folds that are used to create her sleeves. And, you know, if you take a look at what you're wearing, whether you're sitting down as you watch this or standing up, note the way the clothes, your clothes are falling around your body. Do you see the way that my jacket scrunches up around the fold of my arm? It's very similar on the sleeve of this angel's gown. And then of course, this wonderful different colors of streaky glass used for the ethereal background. Now this window was probably larger than this panel that you see here. It likely had a memorial panel, a memorial plate at the bottom. Um, I think that Matt, you probably already noted the signature Tiffany Studios New York here. And the top of the window probably had a continuation of some kind of Gothic styled um, architectural tracery. That's probably a whole separate panel here. Again, we're not sure of the church that, that these came out of. Additional research will hopefully yield an answer to that in the coming years. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of what these windows look like and the ways in which some of the textured glass that we were looking at could be used. Note that the only use of painting in Tiffany's windows as, as time went on, he relented and used a little bit of paint, but it's the flesh areas her face and hair, her beautiful hands, 
and the delicate little toes and feet that are peeking out at the bottom of her gown. Now, I thought that I would give you just a very quick walkthrough of some of the behind the scenes that people don't usually get to see when they do come to visit us for, on a tour. So you've seen the much larger pieces of glass that we have in the collection, ranging from full uncut sheets to kind of shard size. But take a look at what else we have. Bins and bins of tiny pieces of glass again, that were left over, that were preserved by the Tiffany Studios because they were still useful for mosaics. So look at the, the size of the pieces just in this bin, how tiny some of them are. These are all iridescent little chips and shards of glass, again, that are left over from making mosaics like the Grand uh, Dream Garden that we were discussing a moment ago. So these have all been sorted by type. Um, sorted by color and we store them in these small bins um, because it's the most practical way to keep track of them. But then I also wanted to give you a sense of our press glass jewel storage. So each of these containers and perhaps you can see on the front we have photographs. Each of these containers contains our sorted jewel collection. So they're organized by type and by color. In some instances, we only have one or two examples of a jewel, and in other instances, we may have hundreds. And that is the case for, let's see, maybe not these, for these jewels. Here you get a sense that we only have one of this particular size and surface but a multitude of some of these other smaller, dark colored iridescent ones. So all of the pressed glass jewels have been sorted and organized. We continue to press on, no pun intended, with our work with the, um, with the sheet glass collection. And because some of these pieces are so incredibly small, it's taking a very long time to carefully organize and isolate the different types of glass. Um, and Matt, were you interested in taking a peek, sharing with everyone this, this one little jewel? I know it perhaps looks a, a bit forlorn, but this is a lighting fixture that is the earliest in our collection, probably from the early 1890s. This is a fixture that I am currently investigating and I share it with your wonderful group in the hopes that maybe someone will recognize it. I continue to pour over period photos of spectacular Gilded Age mansions, hoping to catch a glimpse of it, but I have not been successful thus far. This is a wonderful fixture, leaded glass fixture, that was originally gas. It was converted to electricity and covering these um, four corners are these gorgeous, leaded glass globes that we do have in the collection, but they're, they're in storage. We don't store them all together, obviously. But I suspect that given the color palette and the patterning, um, this may have been in a room that was devoted to Chinese porcelain, for instance, based on the blue and white um, pattern that you see in the leaded glass. We've had a conservation estimate for it, and so hopefully we will be returning this to its original glory and we'll actually know the story of it um, in the next couple of years. It's one of my ongoing research projects. So if you have, if this looks familiar to you, please do get in touch with me. I would love to hear from you. Now let's take a look. I have one more wonderful, exciting thing to show you. We are currently working on a new traveling exhibition because the new set collection of Tiffany Glass is a little unusual as a museum. We do not have our own museum building. We have a gallery at the Queens Museum in Flushing uh, where we have a, a gallery dedicated to our collection. We offer changing exhibitions. Um, that's the way that you can see our collection in New York City. But by and large, we have a traveling exhibition that uh, visits museums around the country. And so our next traveling exhibition 
is going to be entitled Tiffany or Tiffoni, The Art of Connoisseurship. And we're really excited about this show because it will make use of one part of our collection that we have never really mined, but it's a substantial study collection of, uh, of fake Tiffany lamps. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense, and maybe you can even show these wonderful wisteria, Matt. The lamps that you see here, these are all forgeries. And the reason that they're forgeries and not reproductions is because they have phony signatures. They were made with the intent to deceive. And we suspect that Dr. Neustadt probably was deceived by these. You have to keep in mind that when Dr. Neustadt started collecting in 1935, through his death in 1984, Google didn't exist. There were very few books on Tiffany. Dr. Neustadt had written the only book on Tiffany's lamps, entitled The Lamps of Tiffany, published in 1970. And he had to learn by looking and collecting. There were no Tiffany lamp experts abounding where he could ask questions. And so he, like so many collectors as they're just beginning, made mistakes along the way. And I will tell you that these lamps, in many instances, are superlative examples. And so we have been gearing up to do this exhibition for a number of years. This has been on my, on my wish list of exhibitions to share with the public. Uh, and so we will be taking authentic examples from our collection. We have, for instance, two authentic wisterias. And we will be showing them with these four or five forgeries. And we will be teaching the public how to distinguish an authentic Tiffany from a forgery. And what you're seeing here represents the final sort of antiques roadshow moment, if you will, in the exhibition where we mix up the real and the fake together and using the public, using their newfound knowledge, will hopefully be able to distinguish the real from the fake. So stay tuned. We're hoping that this show will begin to travel in 2022. We're very excited to get it on the road. We can't wait to see it. <laughs> Um, I think this has been such an incredible tour, and I hope you don't mind if I ask you a few questions. I love it, no. Um, I know that in your tenure as the director of the Neustadt Collection, you decided to open the collection up to the public, and which I think was an amazing choice. Um, can you talk about why you made that decision and how you made that possible? Yes. So the space that you're visiting today serves as both our office and our conservation studio and of course storage. And we have really been kind of pressed for space historically. And we've stored a lot of uh, traveling crates for the objects in this space, in some of these aisleways that you have um, been traveling through. So we didn't actually have enough room to welcome the public. So we've gotten additional storage cleared things out to make it, you know, physically, uh, to allow people to physically access the space. But the reason that that was such a goal was because this Tiffany Glass archive constitutes one of the most important parts of our collection, but it's very difficult to share with the public. And so anytime we've done a traveling exhibition and we've been traveling shows for about 25 years, we always include a selection of glass in that show to just give like a little bit of a teaser or taste of this wonderful holding. But as you can imagine, I mean, if you were to just see the selection on the table that we were looking at, no matter how wonderful it is, it still doesn't give you a sense of the depth and breadth of this holding. And so it was a real priority to be able to welcome people, admittedly in small numbers, but welcome people to see this archive and to really begin to understand the importance of this glass and the beauty of the glass. I mean. I will say that I had worked at another Tiffany Museum, the Morse Museum of Art in Winter Park, before coming to the Neustadt. And so I was well acquainted with how absolutely stunning Tiffany's windows and, and other you know, works of art were. But it wasn't until I got to the Neustadt collection that I really appreciated kind of the true artistry of his windows and all of his leaded glass. You know, it's not just about having a really beautiful design. You have to have 
beautiful materials to make these works of art sing, to make them memorable. And so this collection really enables us to tell that story. So the way that we interpret our collection of you know, finished objects, if you will, is through this lens of materials of which we have and making. And we have a brilliant conservator who's been in the business for 50 years and has seen the birth of the restoration of American stained glass. And so she really has enabled us to help the public to understand just what goes into this kind of painstaking labor intensive process of making Tiffany's lamps and his windows. I think it's been a, an amazing decision and I'm so glad that you pushed forward with that initiative. Another project that you worked on that I thought had incredible foresight and was amazing was your exhibition loan program to medical facilities throughout yes. the city, throughout New York City. Um, and I know that you just wrapped up your first installation. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that process and what inspired you to um, initiate that. that Absolutely. Um, so we have an exhibition called Tiffany's Shade Garden, which is um, a small group of floral lamps that we make available to um, medical facilities. And so our first venue was to um, a site in Montefiore in the Bronx. And then our second venue, which we just wrapped up and it was, it was extended because of the pandemic, uh, was to Burke Rehabilitation um, Center in Westchester, also part of the Montefiore family. And, you know, we are interested because we don't have our own, you know, sort of huge grand exhibition space, we're interested in sharing as much of our collection as we can with the public at any given time. And we do still have things, even when our, our traveling exhibition is out on the road and our gallery at the Queens Museum is, you know, filled with a wonderful exhibition, we do still still have some things in storage. And so we were trying to think again, kind of outside of the box about how we could share them and where these objects could really do some good. And so, you know, as you well know, as a, as a museum professional, as a decorative arts historian, when you mount an exhibition at, you know, at Winter Tour, for instance, in some ways you're speaking to the choir, right? I mean, people understand generally, you know, who Louis Comfort Tiffany is. Um, the general public, in my experience, knows the Tiffany name, but doesn't understand that Louis Comfort Tiffany was an artist, was the founder of this grand art atelier, maybe even thinks that Tiffany is a woman in some instances. People have said to me, you know, who, who was Tiffany? Who was she? So we wanted to, you know, bring some beauty. We wanted to educate more of the general public, not just kind of the rarefied museum going crowd, but we also wanted to bring, um, some kind of comfort and distraction and maybe even a little bit of an education to those people who were having a medical crisis, um, to the family members who were waiting while they were receiving treatment and were nervous. We wanted it to be, you know, a soothing, restful sort of experience that maybe would divert them for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. So um, we're really proud of the initiative. Of course, it's been temporarily put on hold because of the pandemic. Um, you know, museum budget or uh, hospital budgets are stretched thin. And to be perfectly candid, you know, we're not we're not eager to go rushing into a hospital to install these exhibitions. We have bigger problems that, you know, we as a nation have bigger problems to address. But we expect that we will have the show up and running once, you know, people have been vaccinated and things return to some kind of normal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you for asking mm -hmm. about that. It's amazing. And I have another question that's sort of maybe unfair and slightly poetic, but <laughs> what do you feel, Tiffany is so iconic within the lexicon of American art, and why do you feel like that this work, this body work has so much resonance for people and continues to mean so much? Um, I th that's a really, really good question. And I, I do think that, you know, it's the, it's the beauty of, of his work that so captures people's imagination and makes his work so memorable. Um, I think within the within the span of his over, I think it's the lamps, mm -hmm. maybe the windows, but I really do think that anytime people see a leaded glass lamp, it could be at TGI Fridays, for instance, they think Tiffany lamp, even though it's not manufactured by Tiffany. But the leaded glass form is so iconic that I think it's very firmly embedded in Americans' minds as being associated with the Tiffany name. But really i do think it's the the beauty of the glass i mean the colors are just so rich and soft and warm and inviting and 
you know, who doesn't like to see something that's beautifully colored, especially in sort of the, what can be a bland day to day. So I think that the warmth of the color and also the light passing through it captures people's imaginations and transports them even if momentarily. And I want to give our viewers and participants an opportunity to get more involved in Neustadt. How can yeah. they do that right now? Uh, well, we have a website, thenewstat.org, that you can visit. And we've recently launched, at the beginning of the pandemic, a new um, virtual program called Tiffany Tetter Tet, where once a month we talk to um, one another. Our assistant curator, Morgan Pruden, and I have all of these wonderful topics that we've been exploring, researching over the last several years. So we share tales of wonderful Tiffany discoveries. We talk about favorite lamps and lamps on wish lists. The, we've talked about Clara Driscoll, the manager of the women's glass cutting department. So the topics are pretty wide and varied. Um, you can sign up for those on Eventbrite. You can link to them through our website. And um, we look forward once all of this is over and done with to welcome people back live. But in the meantime, it's been so tremendous to have you and Matt, our cameraman, <laughs> here to share this, this wonderful treasure, and wonderful part of our collection with the Decorative Arts Trust supporters. And it's been so amazing to see it. Thank you so much for being yeah, so generous you. and sharing all of your brilliant wealth of knowledge. This has been a real treat and I look forward to seeing you all this evening for our next tour. So thank you all. Thank you.